Hello, this is the first video in a series of videos that I'm going to do on calculus. There are actually four calculuses, or calculi, um, or calculi, I don't know which one it is. Um, the first calculus was that of Eudoxus of Nidus, who's an ancient Greek. Uh, this is the method of exhaustion. Uh, the second calculus was that that Newton used during his, the plague years when he was retreated to his farm in Wolfsthorpe. Um, the third calculus is that of Leibniz. Then the fourth cal calculus is the calculus that Newton used in his 1687 publication of the Principia. Um, I will do today, this video will be on the method of Leibniz. The next video will be on the fourth calculus, Newton's geometrical calculus that he used in the Principia. And then the final video will be on the methods of exhaustion, so Eudoxus. Um, so let's get started. So Leibniz's notation feels very familiar uh, to any student of calculus today. However, it's not used, he didn't use it the same way that we use it. And so let me explain what I mean by that. So let me just start up the, the pad here. Um, record. Leibniz. My writing on this iPad is so terrible. Okay, so there's two things to know about it. One is he was thinking of these dx's and dy's as, as things he was going to use in ratios. And the second thing to keep in mind is that the limit, which is implicit in Newton's calculus, uh, is not implicit in, in Leibniz's. So let me show you what I mean by that. So when he writes down y equals x squared, for example, what he means is that y is valid. Uh, y will be valid, will be a valid xy tuple uh, given the constraint that y is equal to x squared. And that's kind of what he meant by it. Um, so he didn't think of these as functions so much. At least that's my understanding. So let me do an example with y equals x squared. So what would he have done? He would have written down y plus dy equals x. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no. x plus dx squared. Then he would have expanded upon that to write x squared plus 2dx plus dx squared. Now notice that the x squared he would have then replaced by y so that he could then write that dy was equal to 2dx, am I missing a term in that? Yes, I am, of course. 2x dx, 2x dx, uh, plus the dx squared. So next he would have divided by dx throughout to get dy over dx equals 2x plus dx. And now we can take the limit as dx approaches zero, or approaches zero to get that. So I write uh, limit as dx approaches zero gives us that dy over dx is equal to 2x. And then I assume he used the, the usual algorithm uh, for polynomials and would have stated that and used that from then on. Uh, but So th that's what it would look like for uh, a simple polynomial like y equals x squared. Let's look at uh, like a trig function. That should be interesting. So let's say that y is equal to the sine of x. Okay, we would do basically the same thing. We would write y plus dy equals the sine of x plus dx. And now we need to expand the sine using a simple the, the sum, uh, sum of two angles uh, trigonometric identity. We would get that y equals the sine of x times the cosine of dx plus the cosine of x times the sine of dx. Kind of ran out of room there. And so I think at this point, he would have... So now we'll, we'll take the limit as dx approaches 0. Now note that uh, what's going to happen here? Well, the cosine of dx is going to approach 1, right? And the sine of dx is going to approach dx, right? This would be otherwise known as the small angle approximation, I think. The sine of theta is approximately theta for small angles. Okay, so then we can rewrite that as y plus dy equals, we would get the sine of x, which of course is y, um, plus the cosine of x times dx. Well, since sine of x is just y, then y minus y is 0, so we'll get dy equals cosine of x dx. Divide out the dx again. dy over dx equals the cosine of x. And there's the familiar 
derivative of the sine function. And let's uh, maybe just look at it one more time for the cosine and see what we get there. So if we write this down for the cosine, we'll get y equals the cosine of x, uh, y plus dy is going to be equal to the cosine of x plus dx. This time, however, the expansion is going to look like the cosine of x times the cosine of dx minus the sine of x times the sine of dx. As we take the limit, as dx approaches 0, this is going to reduce to, well, cosine x will, cosine of dx will go to 1 again, and so we'll get cosine of x, that's just y, um, minus the sine of x dx. And so we get the cosine of x is going to be y again, so that goes away, and we just get that dy over dx is equal to minus the sine of x. And I think that's a pretty cool way to look at uh, the, these derivatives. Now, it's not at all how we use it today, and oftentimes it's abused. Uh, this notation is abused, but uh, so it can be misleading to a degree. Uh, but I think this is instructive to, to see how it was originally uh, devised uh, in, in, the, in the Leibniz notation. And so that's really all I have to show on that. I'm not an expert in, in, in Leibniz or his methods, but uh, this I came across at some point and I thought it was worthwhile sharing. Uh, in the next video, we'll look at Newton's geometrical method and we'll apply it to the trigonometric function. We'll do it to sine, cosine, and maybe the tangent. Um, so I'll see you then.